I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8 this morning for a lesson. I don't know that I have a, a favorite chapter in the Bible, but Romans 8 is definitely up there. All right. Up here. There's a whole lot in Romans 8. We should probably spend weeks, if not months, looking at the whole chapter. But chapter 7 of Romans ends, you know, with the struggle of Paul describes of the flesh versus the spirit, the, the inward man versus the outward man that we struggle with, and he yeah. includes that with saying that we have ultimate victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In chapter 8, he kind of builds on that, and he starts with you know, probably a common verse, that there's therefore now no condemnation of them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Tells yeah. us that we have, we are without condemnation, we're in Christ. And he goes on to tell how the law could not save, but how that Christ condemned sin in the flesh. And he continues uh, from there to talk about how the carnal mind and the flesh are enmity with God, cannot please God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Then it describes how that we are heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, and how that our current sufferings aren't worthy to be compared to what awaits us as children of God. And he tells us how that the Spirit makes an intercession for us. And then we see what's often called the golden chain of redemption where he goes all the way from the foreknowledge of God to our glorification and how the, really in the mind of God it's already as good as done. Amen. Then Here's the ending part. He proposes several questions. Uh, verse 31, probably one of the more common ones. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. Yeah. You all remember some of you guys that posted on behind the pulpit. Mm -hmm. There is a story behind that. When Brother Rich was first camp pastor there, there were some that opposed him. They shot through the door and they burnt down the parsonage. And oh, Lord. Somewhere along the way, they put up that. Sign behind the pulpit of God before us who can be against us. Mm. But, <laughs> that's when they put that other one there that was there until a couple years ago. But I want to look at verse 35. Verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? He starts off here with who or what, you might say, shall separate us from the love of Christ. Like, is there anything that can separate us? <laughs> As we'll see, there isn't anything. But I'd like to look at these things that are listed here. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, the love of Christ is probably a topic we could spend the rest of the day on. Verse 34 sums it up, I think, very well. He says, who is... Who is it, or who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also made an intercession for us. The love of Christ was so great that he died, and then he rose again, that he's even now making an intercession for us. Amen. Certainly it goes much deeper than that, but I guess a good summary of what his love is for us, and that he died for us. Amen. Now, who shall separate us from this love? He says, He says, shall tribulation, this is affliction or troubles, they certainly cannot separate us, can they? Right. We see Amen. Joseph had tribulations, yet he was not separated from the love of God. Was he? Amen. Let's turn to Acts for just a moment. Hold our place there in Romans. Acts chapter 7. Well, the story of Joseph is found from chapters 37 through chapters 41 of Genesis, but here in Acts 7, if Stephen is preaching, and he kind of sums up the life of Joseph in Acts 7, verses 9 and 10. It says that the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. Amen. And delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king 
of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house. Amen. If the Bible never promises that tribulations won't come. Right. But it does say that he will deliver us in them. Amen. So Joseph Amen. is probably the best example we have of that. Amen. Uh, it says here that he was he was literally sold into slavery, and it says God was with him and delivered him out of all of his afflictions. You know, he went to Potiphar's house and became so high ranking that Potiphar just trusted him with everything that he had. Right. Of course, then Potiphar's wife told a lie on him. And right. He was cast into prison. You know, the flesh would say, the world would say, well, see, God must not. Well, it's not favoring me anymore. Mm -hmm. I must be doing something wrong. But no, God was still with them, even in prison. Amen. He delivered them out of that affliction. Yeah. And eventually made him governor over all of Egypt. I don't want to get off topic for a second, but we, we always look at things from, I guess, our humanistic standpoint and think, right. why is God allowing this? Joseph could have been in Potiphar's house the rest of his life and he could have served him and I'm sure he would have been a faithful servant and God would have blessed him in that I'm sure yet God had a greater plan for him Amen he would eventually go from prison to governor over all Egypt it says Amen right. so we should be Careful to question why God allows stuff That's to happen right. to us. Amen. That's right. But none of those things was ever God, was ever He God forsaken. Amen. None of those things was He ever separated from God or the love of God. And the love of Christ and the love of God are the same thing. Who God so loved us that He sent His Son to die for us. Mm -hmm. Right. Also thinking of the three Hebrews and I, Azariah and Mishael, or we call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, they certainly had tribulation, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, Christ was literally with them in the fire. That's it. So he really does the same for us today, though, isn't it? The problem is sometimes we try to fight our own fires, if you will. So God cannot be separated from his people by tribulation. So if literal fire didn't separate, then certainly our little tribulations we have in this life won't separate us. Mm -hmm. so John 16, 33, Christ said, In the world you shall have tribulation. But he says, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. So don't be surprised if tribulations come away. We never let us think that God has left us or that we have been separated from Him and His love. For God's far greater than all the tribulations that come against us. Amen. And He goes on to say, or distress. That word literally means a narrow place or a tight spot. I would say there was. Distress and tribulation often go together. We get distressed when we're in tribulations. We we worry about stuff. I'm sure if no one else was distressed, Jonah was. Mm -hmm. He was literally in a fish's belly. And yet he says that he cried out to God and God heard him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jonah chapter two. We don't have to turn there, but nope. left to himself, he would have been. I seem destroyed by the by the fish, but yet God delivered him. Well, not even this great fish, this whale, as it's called one place, can could separate God from His prophet, even though He was an unfaithful servant at the time. Right. So that is the difference between God's love and man's idea of love. Mm -hmm. God's love doesn't require. Perfect faithfulness. We ought to desire that. Even if we find ourselves in rebellion like Jonah, we can be sure that 
lo, God will not be separated from us. Amen. I'm sure Job was distressed as well. Mm -hmm. when he, his kids were destroyed, all his stuff was taken. The only thing he had left was his wife who just told him, curse God and die. Mm -hmm. yeah. At least from a fleshly standpoint, that would be a very distressing situation to be in. Right. All in just the space of a short time. All that to fall upon him. And yet he says he all that he's sitting not against God. Amen. He charged God foolishly. No tribulations and distresses these things cannot separate us from the flow of God. Let's turn for just a moment to Psalm 107. Psalms 107, it doesn't say who the author it is. I'm not sure if it was David or someone else. But verse 6, also verses 13, 19, and 28 say almost the same thing. He's speaking of the Israelites here. He says, And they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he just delivered them out of their distresses. Amen. God is faithful to deliver his people out of our distresses. So no distresses will not separate us from God or his love. Amen. Going back to our text, it says, or persecution. Mm -hmm. That's one we don't know much about in our day. Right. But yet, persecution will not separate us from the love of God either. Well, that may come one day. Yeah. And if it does, we ought not to paint and say, why, God, why has God left us? We ought to be like the early church was. Mm -hmm. Acts 5.41 says, They went away rejoicing, but they were kind of worthy of suffering, shame for his sake. Now that's contrary to the flesh is thinking. Mm -hmm. But persecution will not separate us either. Amen. Yeah. Paul was often in persecution. I'm sure he felt worthy of persecution because he persecuted the church so much. Mm -hmm. Let's turn just for a moment to 2 Timothy. I can't quite remember what he says there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse number 10 and 11 says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Amen. Paul, he said he suffered persecutions at Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. Yeah. And he said the Lord delivered him out of all of those. Amen. Paul knew firsthand that persecutions would not separate him from the love of God. And he goes on from persecutions to say famine. Well, that's one that you don't think about here in America is famine. Mm. You know, even when the grocery stores were looking a little empty last year, I'd say most of us had plenty of food at home. Right. I know I went just to get some food when the pandemic first started and I couldn't find hardly anything. Right. Well, we don't know much about famine in America. You know, even if famine comes, it will not separate us from God. Our bellies might get empty and they might start to growl, but yet God will still be with us. Amen. If nothing else, it's the life of Elijah ought to show us this. Mm -hmm. If you recall in 1 Kings 17, he prayed that it wouldn't rain. For the space of three and a half years, it didn't rain. Amen. There was a great famine. Yet God, he sustained them by the brook chariot there for a while. He had the, the ravens come and bring him his food. Yep. Then after the brook dried up, most of us said, well, God, what are we going to do now? They got sent to the widow woman. Mm -hmm. Again, fleshly thinking that's 
We would want God to send us to the king's palace, wouldn't we? Mm. Or would woman who had nothing but one little handful of meal in her world, just enough. She said she was going to make a cake for her and her son, and he didn't die. Mm. And God said she shall sustain me. That our God is able to deliver us even in famine. I mean, if the cattle of a thousand hills are here, are his, certainly he can provide for us. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, Luke, over in Luke chapter 4, Christ even mentions Elijah, how he was in that famine. I mean, it says that, really he's pointing out how the Israelites were not as faithful as they thought they were. Amen. So there were all these widows of Israel, yet he's Send them to the. Can't think of where she was from now. It starts with the S. Remember there, Luke chapter four, verse twenty-five. It says. Luke 4, 25, if I tell you the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But another of them was Elias sent Salem to Seraphath, that's what it was, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, he says there were many widows in Israel, but he didn't send them to them. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there were many people in Israel who weren't you know, starving, if you will. They were, had plenty to eat, and yet God said, go over here to this woman, and she shall sustain thee. So certainly God can just sustain us. Mm -hmm. Either by ravens or by a poor widow woman. I know we, today we have food stamps and government help and food banks and all these quote unquote ministries. Mm. Whatever God uses though, he will sustain his people. Amen. One thing I noticed about these things listed here in Romans 8, most of them deal with physical things, don't they? Especially the famine and the next couple of years, nakedness. There's really nothing physical that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God. Amen. So let's go back to our text here it says, or nakedness. And that means nakedness. Right. <laughs> it could be that they didn't have sufficient clothing. You know, naked in that day meant just you were underdressed. Mm. You know, we, we think of nakedness, we think of completely naked. And certainly that is one aspect of it. But Peter, the gospel said that Peter was naked in the ship because he didn't have all his clothes on. Anyway, that's a different point, but this nakedness here could not separate us either, so I think it indicates a lack of physical needs, yeah. mm -hmm. but even that cannot separate us from God or His love. But First Timothy 6, 8 says, having food and raiment there with be content. But it doesn't say if you don't have food and raiment, then God's not with you anymore. In fact, the, the prophets of old oftentimes Went without them. Right. Let's go over to Hebrews 11 and read about some of those. But just because you might not have all that you need or think you need doesn't mean God has left you. Sometimes He has to take us to a place where we realize He is sufficient. Right. Hebrews 11, verse 36 through 38. Went, he went through and described some of the great men of faith and women of faith. And he says he doesn't really have time to tell all of them. Verse 36, he says, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, jail, moreover, of bond and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder. Were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Right. 
Where he says, and these all have obtained a good report through faith received not the promise. Amen. So they didn't have fine clothing. So they had sheepskins and goatskins. They didn't have nice houses. They said they wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And yet God was still with them. God love had not been separated from them just Amen. because they lacked physically. It says in fact that they obtained a good report through faith. You know, the difference even for them is they had to look forward in faith to Christ coming. Amen. They didn't even get to see the fulfillment of the promises in their lifetime. Yet we have complete fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecies and in Christ and all the promises of Christ. And we see countless examples of God's faithfulness and yet we would we be as faithful as these to wander around in sheepskins and goatskins and mm -hmm. to live in caves and dens and, or in the desert. No, I don't think I'd want to leave you a den or a cave but I definitely wouldn't want to I have to sleep out in the desert. Right. Yet you know, if we find ourselves there, none of that will separate us from the love of God. Man. So there is nothing in this world that will separate us. Amen. Yeah. Many times we act as if it will, though. Oh, God, why have you put, left me? Why have you, or why aren't you doing this for me? We think too carnally, oftentimes. Amen. When he goes on from nakedness to say, or peril. And this peril is danger, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't live too dangerously in America, especially here in our part of the country. Maybe if you were in Chicago, it would be a little different. But right. Sometimes God may lead us into dangerous situations. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, he was turned over there. He was going to go down to Jerusalem. And the other brother said, No, Paul, you probably shouldn't do that. Hmm. Acts 20, verses 22 through 24. It says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Paul had faith. Didn't he? he said, not knowing the things that shall be following me there. Amen. Most of us want to plan exactly what's going to happen, and how it's going to happen, and when it's going to happen. God, when you tell me all that, then I'll do it. That's not generally the way God works. Amen. Verse 23 says, Say that the Holy Spirit witness in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Well, he knew that much. So we, we always want to know how it's going to go and everything. The only thing he knew was that bonds and afflictions would be there for him. Again, not the type of mentality we usually go into things with. Saying, oh, well, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be rough. Mm -hmm. And he goes on to say, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto me, so that I might... Finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul knew trouble was going to come his way, but he says, None of these things do. Neither count I my life dear unto me. Or are we willing to face trouble for the cause of Christ? Or if we do find ourselves in danger and troublous situations, we should not worry that God will not be with us. Amen. We should have the same faith that Paul did, knowing that if we're following the Holy Spirit, then it really doesn't matter what may come our way. Mm -hmm. When I think of that brother, and we wouldn't agree with us all, I think he was related to the crap somehow. We went over there to that African or Middle Eastern country and was shot. Mm -hmm. so that was a, a perilous situation he was in. 
Amen. I had to give him credit that he was willing to go in such a place to spread the gospel. That's it. Amen. Most of us are not willing to go across the street. Amen. Yeah. Because sometimes peril may come our way, danger may come our way, but yet God is still with us. Let's go. Let's go to First Samuel for a moment. David and his men were facing a dangerous situation. At this point, David was still fleeing from Saul. First Samuel chapter 23. In fact, chapter 22 ends with uh, I what's it? I forgot how to say his name there. The priest had came down to David. Saul had killed the Lord's priest, it says in verse 21. David said that to abide with me, fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be in safeguard. But then in chapter 23, we we'll begin reading in verse 1 that says, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? David's men were facing danger, if you will. They had Saul in Judah trying to kill them. Now David wanted them to go fight the Philistines. Right. Who were probably a much mightier force than they were, fleshly speaking. And notice what verse 4 says Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah. If he had something this time. For I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. Amen. For we ought not worry when God tells us to go to battle for him. Even if the force is mightier than we. But David say to Goliath, the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Verse Samuel 17, 40, verse 47. Verse 5 says, So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smoked them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Because even in the face of danger, God is with us. We have nothing to fear. Amen. Even with enemies... Wherever we go about us, that that will not separate us from God or His love. We have one more point here in our text, Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 35, ends with or sword. Hmm. So even if they kill us, will that separate us from the love of God? Amen. 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 Not. If no one else knew that, James knew it, didn't he? Turn over to Acts chapter 12 for just a moment. Acts chapter 12. Oops, I keep going in the wrong direction here. Mm -hmm. Verse number 1 says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Mm -hmm. James was... Well, Stephen was, I guess, the first martyr. And then James following. He says he faced the sword. Did that separate him from God or God's love? Certainly not. Peter was given the next one to be killed. The Lord right. delivered him. Some might say, well, why did God not let James get killed and we saved Peter? I don't know that I have an answer to that other than it was James' time to go and he had another plan for Peter. Amen, that's it. You can be sure James went to be home with the Lord as soon as that sword fell upon him. Well, I, I certainly don't desire to be slain by the sword, but if that so be the plan of God, yet that shall not separate us from them. Amen. Well, if they 
bring back the guillotine and start chopping heads off. And that will not separate us either. Amen. I want to read the, the last couple of verses of there in Romans 8, and we'll close. I had originally wanted to look at each of those things mentioned here in the last two verses, but time is not going to allow for that. So, verses 38, 39. On the same thought here, Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, so there we see that death cannot separate us from God or his love. It says, Nor life, so this present life and these things cannot separate us from the love of God. It says, Nor angels. Amen. Whether they're good or bad, it's certainly Satan himself is an angel. So Satan himself cannot separate us from the love of God. Nor principalities, that's the government. Mm-hmm. Nor powers, that's those in authority. Nor things present. Things presently don't look the best in our country, but yet that shall not separate us from the love of God. Amen. Or things to come. So I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, as long as it is. Yeah. Oh, things get worse, that won't separate us. If they get better, that won't separate us either. That's it. Amen. So, nor height nor depth. So, it doesn't matter how high we go or how low we go. So, the depths of the sea or the heights of the mountains or the skies, whatever it may be, that cannot separate us from God and His love. He said, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God or sin in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So no other creature, no man, not even yourself. We'll close with that thought. Amen.